Okay. Right. Can, can uh, everyone hear me all right? Yes, that's perfect. That's fine. Okay. Well, good evening to everyone. Um, the title of the talk tonight will become apparent shortly. And when I use the word transformed, it's not always in a good way, I, I have to say. And the talk uh, was expanded, has been expanded from one that I gave back in 2016 at a seminar at Culloden, which coincided with the publication of the joint initiative undertaken by the Society for the Protection of Ancient Buildings and HES in recording all of the surviving thatch buildings uh, in Scotland. You might be aware of this and it's available online. It's not, uh, the screen isn't shifting. I'll have to do this manually, I think, on screen. There we go. So the title alludes to uh, Daniel Morgland's book, which was published in 2009. Again, some of you may, be, uh, may have read this, be aware of it. And in his book, he refers primarily to improved houses and perhaps those that are more associated with polite architecture than vernacular buildings per se. And if there is a drawback in the book, it's because um, he relies on statistics which uh, come from the sites that are de designated, which could produce a distortion both in the analysis and conclusions he reaches. Because as many of you know, um, most of the sites that we look at um, are not designated, they're neither listed nor, nor scheduled. Um, this uh, is the archetypal contemporary image of a hut or a hovel of the type described vividly by Samuel Johnson on his 1773 tour with James Boswell. And it's the blacksmith's house at uh, Arras on Mull, um, recorded by Thomas Garnet on his tour in 1800. And yet the families who lived in these um, extremely primitive conditions did not do so uh, as savages, but they did, they did so with great dignity. And it's a way of life that was captured still in the 1930s by Margaret Fay Shaw and Werner Kissling when photographing the buildings in, in the US. So we have uh, a bar dwelling, uh, which is represented here with the uh, chimney on the ridge of the roof, no doubt offset from where an open half uh, may be at uh, the, the uh, floor level. Uh, and as a bar dwelling, the animals would have uh, entered through the door and be to one side on the lower side where the ground slopes, uh, uh, slopes where the effluent would fall away and uh, the uh, family would live on the other side. It's a form of living that was greatly frowned upon by the parish ministers in the statistical accounts. Now, Annie Shaw's castle in Nairn, photographed by George Washington Wilson, was uh, one of the most celebrated of the uh, hovels referred to. It was constructed of turf walls, as you, as, uh, as you see here. It's a type of house that was, uh, at one stage, uh, very common uh, uh, to the west of the River Spey. And very often nowadays, the only evidence of these structures are humps in the ground. And in the most cases, they will have been plowed out uh, completely or lost due to, to uh, afforestation. There's evidence here that the thatch was once uh, pr uh, repaired in broom. I'm going to move briefly to the county of Caithness where I carried out um, uh, a, a study for the North Highland Initiative on uh, recording uh, redundant vernacular buildings uh, across the whole of the county. This was published in 2008. Uh, but this drawing relates to the beautiful harbour, which is um, at Sarklet uh, near Wick. And it's a planned village by Brodie of Hopeville, uh, and the plans were drawn up at around about 1800 for this. Um, it, was, it was laid out primarily for uh, fishing rather than agriculture. But what you'll see here that in this sort of uh, a typical uh, improved cottage with the uh, chimneys at each uh, gable, that the intention was for the uh, houses here to have been uh, slated originally. And the only part of the uh, plan that was ever, uh, that ever went ahead was the central portion leading direct to the harbour. 
And this is one of the wonderful um, photographs which are in the collection of the um, Wick Society by uh, Johnson. Um, but it shows that uh, all of the houses, um, although in the improved form, were thatched. Uh, some receiving lime wash to finishes for neatness, but by no means was this universal uh, uh, across the county. But it's worth noting that by, with the use of flagstone, it was possible to get very neat um, crow steps at the gables, which uh, worked well with the, with the thatching. Now these uh, structures were capable of producing good, simple uh, homes and of instilling a real sense of, of pride amongst those who lived in them. Um, not only do we see here a, a pr productive, beautifully kept uh, pair of gardens um, with beehives to the front and a, and a productive um, a greenhouse, um, but there's also evidence here that the thatching was uh, held down by uh, by ropes which, which are known as Simmons and very neatly held here uh, on a uh, on a rod that runs the full length of the roof. Quite often elsewhere you find that the ends of the ropes are held by uh, stones which are known as bend end stains. And this is in stark contrast to what would be subsistence crofting in uh, certain parts of the uplands of the county and especially across the coastal fringe of the, of the, of the Latheran Parish. We see here the primitive longhouse uh, form uh, where um, cells would be uh, added to the house either above it or below it um, and uh, often a, a single row would, would include more than one dwelling house. Um, this, this photograph is uh, from 1971 from the Commission survey which was undertaken of the area and shows the property of Ramscraigs, which has been ruinous uh, for many years and long abandoned. Uh, but these remain very distinctive features uh, in the Caithness uh, landscape, uh, especially in that, in that uh, particular district. When I show this uh, photograph, I pose the question to the audience, what date do they think when the photograph uh, had been taken? Uh, and often it causes amazement when it's um, heard that this photograph was taken by the commission in 1971 as part of the survey. And this shows the core, which is undoubtedly a site of Northern European significance, which had been run as a, a remote upland farm by two uh, unmarried sisters um, using no machinery and it was only finally finally abandoned around the turn of the millennium when one of the uh, when the last of the sisters went into went into hospital but the interest here is, that has survived is much more than the uh, longhouse which is in this position which had its own uh, uh, garden it survives as much uh, as, a, as, a, as an upland small farm, showing all of the diversity that you find in Caithness small farms. There's much more animal husbandry than you find in other parts of uh, uh, Scotland. And the buildings uh, on the slope, uh, which is from, uh, uh, from west to uh, east, um, overlooking the Firth, um, it utilizes the landform in a remarkable way on this exposed site. And what we get here, in addition to the longhouse, a series of byres which are located here, animal byres. The midden is at this point. There had been a horse gang uh, here which had served uh, the threshing barn, which would have been ventilated on both sides. Um, these are for workshops and there's a cart shed entrance here. Rather um, charmingly, there's a duck pond, which is part of this uh, site, which is shown here. And then at the bottom level, the horses were stabled. Alongside that was a was a was a pigsty. And, and this by no means is unusual uh, among the small farms of the county. This is the longhouse photographed in 2007. And uh, the future of this site remains worryingly un uncertain, although it has very high levels of authenticity. Perhaps the, sa the same cannot be said of this site, which is across in Lewis, and many of you will recognize this. It's a, a Garanon, uh, 
Um, and it's been uh, now really regarded very much rather like a film set and much photographed by visitors from the cruise ships who come to see it. Um, and the majority of the uh, old houses here have been taken down to foundation level and rebuilt, but trying to conform to modern building regulations, which vernacular structures such as this really uh, can never comply with. Well, what I think it does illustrate are the, the organic forms of these buildings and just how they nestle within a fold within the landscape. They are very much buildings, uh, uh, the materials of the, of the land. And this is in uh, stark contrast to the new buildings uh, at, at the top of the site and along the horizon. Um, it, it, it's, it, it's very much a valuable lesson to us still. And if I had worries about authenticity, this is truly authentic. Um, it's the last of the Hebridean black houses of the Lewis type to have been erected in the township right at the bottom of the, um, uh, of the township. It's erected as late as 1902. And it's photographed here in 1973 by the acclaimed Glasgow photographer, uh, Oscar Marzaroli, who observed acutely contemporary Scottish life and he recorded the township uh, in various stages of decay. This is another photograph uh, by him when he returned in 1985. Um, and he was able to capture the full extent of the loss of fabric um, at this critical time. But you'll see here the extent to which uh, the vast majority of the houses, the shells of the houses that have uh, been lost, the, um, uh, the bulk of the fabric has disappeared by this stage. Um, and the site has been subjected to what we might say a selective conjectural reconstruction. Um, but what is captured here on this photograph is the preservation of the cultivation rigs which extend right out into like, fingers into the landscape and the animal enclosures of which some are still uh, in, in use um, in, in the mid 1980s. And this gives the site particular significance. I'm moving down uh, through the islands now to the Isle of Bernere. And this is at uh, Ruskeri. And this is truly life on the, uh, on, on the edge. The high tide line is, is just here. It makes you wonder what would happen uh, with global warming on a site such as this. But these are cotter's houses, which were photographed in 1978. Um, and the impression given across this site is one which is, uh, which is very well cared for. And this is the site as it was uh, photographed in uh, 2009, sadly abandoned and decaying. And this results in an irretrievable loss of cultural value. And this has occurred within the span of a single generation. And we see here that the openness of the foreshore is now interrupted by um, fence lines indicating that private ownership has taken priority over a common land and the unstoppable um, progression, the advance of new kit housing on, on the horizon. I want to speak very briefly about uh, typologies and the risk of um, assuming that what you read is correct. There's a, a gross uh, risk of simplifying uh, uh, typologies that are uh, seen. And these illustrations, again, they may be well known to you, come from Colin Sinclair's book, Thatched Houses of the Old Highlands. It was a seminal work which was published in 1953, but its real value is perhaps not from the suggestion that there are type, um, standard typologies, but it comes from the survey work that he undertook uh, by bicycle, obviously during his um, holidays, uh, during the 1920s and 1930s when the houses were still occupied. Um, by Hebridean, what he referred to generally here were uh, houses found on Lewis, but he also referred to these as being found on the Western Isles, which is not necessarily the case. The sky type would be the um, island of sky and include the buildings of the Western seaboard and the Delradic um, typology would cover the areas of Argyle, Jura and Isla, uh, and also Western Perthshire also maintained. But what's absent here, um, as you may have observed, is uh, the, the structures that you found in the central and northern uh, highlands of the mainland. Uh, the first of three case studies that, that I want to share with you tonight is at Lonbane, uh, Applecross. It's a linear township 
uh, on a site where there had been a nucleated settlement uh, um, around 1750, the time of Roy's map. Um, they, there were townships, a number of them, to the immediate south of uh, Applecross House, um, and there were obviously very con great concerns that these are both insanitary and very high density. And so there was um, um, the repatriation of uh, these sites to other parts of the Applecross estate. And this was most uh, likely undertaken by the eighth Mackenzie Laird, Laird of Applecross before he died in 1822. And we see uh, on the left, the original surveyor's uh, lotting plan. And uh, what exists still today is this um, central um, track uh, which which um, has uh, walls to either side, which would allow the animals to be moved to the higher ground. So this would allow transhumans uh, to be um, happening at this uh, at this early date. Um, but this was a site that was not well suited to uh, fishing um, because of the uh, coastline, and boats were launched uh, further north on the uh, coast at uh, Kalnakil. But it is a highly distinctive linear settlement. And you see here uh, uh, in this detail from the Ordnance Survey map of 1877, the coastal path uh, running up the uh, uh, peninsula which uh, went initially in front of all of the houses and then carried on up to Kalna uh, Kill. And later the um, uh, roadway uh, ran uh, above the site uh, to the east of it. And this um, map of the township was prepared by the commission in 1991 in a great deal of detail. And the, the, um, uh, the cottage that I'd like to fo focus on is uh, here on this, uh, on this plan. Um, but what you find here also um, is, is a corn kiln um, to serve, the, serve this community. Um, these are store, uh, stores and uh, sheds and barns, which are, are separate from the houses. Um, the, uh, the, the thatched house here uh, has its own um, uh, shed, uh, uh, which I'll be able to show you shortly. Um, and there are also kilns for kelp burning from which the uh, community here would have um, benefited um, at some stage, as indeed would, the, um, would be with the proprietor from the money to be earned from this, um, which would have ceased around uh, in the late 1820s. So this is the thatched house in the mid 1990s. Um, uh, it had been passed to the Applecross Trust after the death of the inhabitant in 1990, and it, it was uh, passed in turn to the National Trust uh, for Scotland in 2006. Um, at the top of the uh, settlement, we see here um, a, a white house, for want of a better word, but it's a house that's been converted to two stories, and this um, housed the a postman, a postman who lived here um, for several decades. And the, the um, With the thatched house, uh, we see here that it has at each of the gables um, a pegged turf, um, which, which sort of helps with the stability of the stonework. And the building is thatched in heather. And we have uh, evidence of there having been boat trips for the men and the young boys of the township who would go across to the Isle of Rona uh, in September to pull up the stalks for um, applying uh, heather to the uh, thatch of the of the buildings uh, within the range. But not all of the shells of the um, range have fared well. Um, some of the ruined houses were adapted um, as part of a film set at one point. And the title of the film was Ill Fares the Land, if any of you remember this. It, uh, it was um, dealing with the evacuation of St Kilda, which the site was uh, dressed up to uh, replicate. Uh, it was released in uh, 1982 and it uh, starred Fulton Mackay. Um, but perhaps more than ill fares the land, it's ill fares the structures of the township because they've suffered greatly as a result of, um, uh, of, of the work that was uh, carried out at that time, as you can see. The survival of this uh, thatched house was solely because it was lived in by a recluse, a Duncan or Dunachan, uh, Mackenzie was born in the house around about 1901 and he shunned all publicity 
um, and he's shown here as a young man and in later years. And he would be seen walking uh, down to the shop in Apple Cross for his messages, uh, a round trip of, of uh, 12 miles. Um, we see here the uh, construction of the uh, crux of the uh, cottage, but the line finishes internally would have been introduced uh, later to improve levels of, of comfort. At the center of the plan, there is a closet, um, rather as the sky type. And there are some similarities with the sky type of uh, houses drawn by Sinclair, uh, but not in rea reality all of that, all that many. Uh, this reflects that the knee brace in the um, crack, highly sophisticated levels of carpentry. Um, and uh, there's also the storehouse and the barn to the front of the property, which has wall recesses uh, for, uh, for crux, which are still visible. The interior of the, of the property was uh, heavily uh, smoke blackened, but this is how it appeared in 2009. Um, the good examples of vernacular furniture on the left, there's a three legged um, stick back chair and on the right, uh, a wooden settle. Looking over the rear wall uh, to, of the barn to the front wall of the house, um, what comes across here is the superb skill in the dry and stone walls of the house and certainly of the front wall. Uh, the walls are very slightly uh, battered and this could only have been done by a mason. I think it's inconceivable that it could have been done by a tenant. It is so beautifully done and none of the other houses in the range uh, compare with this. Internally, the finishes were quite uh, basic and were finished in uh, clay, clay plaster originally. I'm moving now um, to the second case study, which takes us to the north of Skye, to uh, Trotternish. And it's a story of land agitation. Um, and we have here William Daniels, uh, William Daniels uh, Aquitant um, of around about 1819, which shows uh, 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 primarily um, that there's a note here on my screen to admit someone. Should I do so, Roland? I, I will do it anyway, that's it, okay. Um, <laughs> uh, and uh, this shows Duntulum uh, a castle which had been the stronghold of the uh, Lords of the Isles and was finally abandoned only in 1732 when uh, the family seat became Monkstadt on the west side of the island, or west side of, of the headland. Um, the Battle of Culloden accelerated breaking the bonds between tenants and their clan chief, who is still living locally. And this was further destroyed when Armadale became the family's their seat in, in Slate in the 17, late 1790s. And the um, successive Lords MacDonald um, seemed to earn themselves a bad name as being profligate absent landlords who had very little interest at this uh, stage in the late 18th century in their tenants and, and their, their well-being. Um, but it, what's shown here is a scene of undoubted prosperity. Not only do we have the um, shepherd relaxing on the stone with his flock of sheep, but in the far distance, we see land which is uh, cultivated, arable land and uh, croft houses. Um, Right, see if we get it. That's it. Um, now this is a state map on the left, um, prepared in 1764, and uh, Kilmuir uh, was known as the Granary of Sky, and you, you can see why that was the case uh, by the degree to which um, this was um, uh, 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 laid out for, for, for arable land. It was also the most populous area of the island, and suffered particularly um, from the impact of the famine years in the 1840s when the potatoes, uh, potato crop failed. The 50 or so crofts were laid out by 1823, but the settlement, um, as we see in the Ordnance Survey uh, map on the right, was probably uh, laid out by um, uh, the first decade of the 19th century. And in the pre-improvement uh, plan, not only do we see the extent of cultivation, it's the degree to which the land was drained, uh, to, to uh, allow uh, uh, um, the cultivation of arable crops uh, throughout the course of the 18th century. There was a mill at uh, Camus, Camus Moor, which is shown here, and this has expanded in the um, 
in, 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 uh, as shown on the Ordnance Survey mappers, which was surveyed in 1878. And this was around the height um, of the uh, troubles of the uh, area. Several of the crofts in the Ordnance Survey map are, are shown as being uh, ruinous at, the, at this time, which reflects the degree to which emigration was encouraged of the population. Um, but the mill complex and the parish church indicate uh, that the parish church is here, uh, um, designed by Gillespie Graham around about 1810, but now stands as a gaunt ruin in the landscape. But it indicates the degree to which this was uh, a balanced a, a, a community um, that, that had been laid out. Uh, and the cross that I'm going to speak uh, about further is here at uh, and number 40, the Venuskite. Um, and and uh, uh, this is largely unchanged uh, from uh, today. So after the years of extreme hardship, the um, Kilmuir estate was sold to Major Fraser of Nairn in 1855, whose interest was purely commercial. And he gained um, considerable notoriety uh, uh, for rack renting um, and uh, uh, the tenants ended up in revolt against this and there are several altercations, not least with Sheriff, Sheriff Ivory of Inverness who would regularly send law officers to, uh, to kill, kill Muir to, invict, to evict the tenants. Now this shows um, the Glendale Martyr in 1884, John McPherson addressing the crofters at Atuig. Um, and we see also here the growing influence of the Highland Land Law Reform, uh, which led to the setting up of the Napier Commission in 1886. Um, a pitch land battle was fully anticipated as a result of the strength of feeling within the district. And it even attracted the London press to attend, uh, fully expecting that this would happen. But what they witnessed was gunboat diplomacy. Um, 400 Marines and 50 uh, armed uh, policemen were lined up. The Marines are, are, are seen uh, landing here and they were set at, um, uh, to be set against a thousand crofters who are watching them uh, warily uh, uh, up on the, the slopes above the cliffs. Here. Um, this illustration comes from the London Illustrated News in December 1884. Um, but the situation was uh, eventually diffused. There was no battle, uh, much, I think, to the um, uh, disappointment of the newspaper reporters. But thereafter, in the months while the uh, Marines were left to um, keep um, control over the crofters, but they lived peaceably uh, in, in, in the months thereafter, um, uh, and there was never any trouble. The, the quarrel was always with the landlord. Now, all of this is really in marked uh, contrast to this tranquil scene which is being photographed here at uh, Uig Bay um, by George Washington Wilson, and probably around about the time that the uh, conflict was uh, predicted. Um, but these are um, the settlement here, the township here um, is, is very largely of unimproved sky houses, with doors set away from the prevailing winds to the rear of the properties. Um, and uh, with centralized hearths, and many of them, uh, some of them with uh, separate uh, buyers and barns. Each of the uh, plots are beautifully tended and cultivated. There has been some mortaring of the external walls, as, as we see here. And this is in marked contrast with the improved white houses in the far distance, which are associated with the, uh, with the Laird's own property. This uh, photograph by Robert Moyes Adam was um, taken after the harvest in 1936 and shows um, the crofts at numbers 39 and 40. And uh, uh, 40 is the croft that we'll look at in more detail. And the land being very uh, carefully managed at this stage. Um, there are haystacks uh, uh, to be seen in, in each of the crofts uh, and also peat stacks are, are, are visible of uh, peats that have been very nice, uh, very neatly stacked. Um, this is also uh, probably mid 1930s, uh, a photograph taken shortly after Angus and, and Beaton um, at number 40 were married. 
Um, it shows uh, a croft house with a neat uh, a straw thatch uh, held down by wire netting and, and stones at the eaves. Um, behind here are some ghostly figures, uh, but the Maybe noted that the walls of this property are well mortared and had probably been lime washed at uh, some stage. Um, after Angus's uh, death, um, valiant efforts have been made by his relatives uh, to maintain the croft, and, and uh, this is the condition in which it was passed to the National Trust in 1997. Once again, this is a site which has been recorded extensively by the, uh, the Royal Commission in 1997. Um, but it had always been maintained, and you'll see this in every historical account of this property, that this is a, a, a croft house which had been built in the 1880s, um, curiously around the time of the agitation. And this had come from a reliable source uh, within the community, Jonathan MacDonald, um, curator of the Museum of Island Life um, at Kilmuir. And he had claimed that this had been built uh, by the uh, Gillis uh, family, who were tenants of the Triple Croft to the north of uh, number 40. But I find that there is no evidence of this uh, claim or of any of the Gillises having occupied the uh, house. Um, and it, it's, it's, it becomes possible to put, for, put forward the postulation that this in fact is a house of around about 1810 or certainly from the first or second decade of the 19th century, which has been modified over time. You can see, if you remember the form of the croft houses in the Washington Wilson photograph, you can see how it would be possible to add the uh, chimneys at each end of the property and introduce windows to the external walls. In all, most other respects, it uh, is still recognizable as uh, one of the earlier houses. And this is confirmed by the slope um, of the land, while many of the properties that, uh, um, within the township are set out to a different orientation. This particular building follows the slope of the land. And it's quite conceivable that this would have been built as a bar dwelling originally uh, with a centralized half. It, it bears all the hallmarks uh, of that. And there's a separate bar uh, and uh, barn, uh, as we saw at uh, Uig, which was, uh, uh, could have been added later, but has a very high level of authenticity in its construction. Um, there would have been animal husband husbandry at one end approach to this door. There's the drain which leads from that area. Uh, with the manger and where the animal pens are located. And the far end of the um, structure would have been used as a barn, which was, uh, which was ventilated. Um, you see here just how primitive the roof construction is and how this is largely formed of uh, driftwood, uh, which is roped together. Um, I heard only recently that one end of the um, barn had uh, collapsed uh, within the space of the, of, of the past few months. And that, of course, is very concerning. What we see here in these photographs um, taken around uh, 2011 that repairs have been carried out in the, in the past with trusses um, introduced with um, formed of sawn timber sections. This is Beaton's Cottage as it was photographed in 2012. And it has been preserved uh, through an ingenious solution of fitting a new shell to the interior of the, of the, of the building. And it remains, uh, or it, uh, until COVID came along at least, it was the most highly sought after of all the National Trust, um, trust let uh, properties in, in, in Highland. We see here that the, um, that the barn um, was of dry stain construction with some localized uh, mortar added uh, to keep the stones in position. This is the interior of the property um, uh, photographed in 2012. The advantage of this uh, solution is that it's fully re reversible in conservation terms. So I'm moving now to the last of the three uh, ca case studies, and we should be looking at this um, image uh, with the strains of handles to see the conquering hero uh, comes in our ears, uh, reflecting the relief of the Hanoverians at the, uh, their triumph at the Battle of Culloden. But this is an entirely fictionalized landscape. Um, it appears on a popular English broadsheet, which was uh, produced two years after the battle. Um, what we see here, the French 
troop ships are on the horizon, which never landed. Um, they're in the Firth, which you would never see from the uh, battle site. Culloden House is also uh, portrayed with its policies, which also would be invisible from the moor. Um, and you see here also an indication of uh, one of the events of the Battle of the Turf Walls being broken down of the parks, um, uh, which is a key point in the battle. And this building at, uh, in the foreground here could have been Old Leonard uh, Cottage, uh, or it could have been the barn um, where the wounded um, Jacobites were um, massacred by burning them. Um, but it's a building of two stories, very English in appearance with a brick chimney. And uh, once again, this is entirely fanciful. And we compare that with this watercolour by Thomas Sandby, which um, would have been prepared, or at least would have been sketched first within two days of the battle, um, when he was working uh, for the Board of Ordnance and before his return back to London. And it's entirely believable in the detail which is being shown. It shows a, a landscape which is recognizable as being Strathnairn. And it reflects also how the buildings um, on the moor of the park enclosures, as you see here, these will be part of the Culloden, Culloden House uh, parks and at the south, southern end of the battle site also, uh, and of the uh, thatched houses on the lower fringes of the uh, battle site um, are also shown. And, and again, these are instantly believable. Uh, there are countless maps of the battle, and this is taken from Peter Anderson's book, which was first published in 1867. But it shows at the foot of the Hanoverian lines, um, Old Leonard Farm, uh, which is the subject of the uh, study, um, which is in the form of a T-shape. And uh, just to the left of that, there is another structure which is shown in more detail um, in this uh, measured survey of the, the battlefield, which again accompanied the um, first edition of his uh, book in 1867. Um, but critically, what we see here um, to the left of Old Leonard House um, is the dotted line of what is referred to as the Red Barn, uh, which is the scene of the massacre, which followed immediately after the battle. Also on this, um, uh, map we see uh, the location of the King Stables uh, uh, cottage, which is also T-shaped, not unlike uh, the property at Old Leonard, uh, which is another survivor of the battle and hence historically important. And this comes from, um, again, Anderson's book of 1867, showing Old Leonard Farm as it was at that time in a semi-ruinous uh, condition. Um, the, the external walls um, are constructed uh, of, of uh, field boulders, but they're bound in uh, clay mortar. Um, but what we see here at the upper part of the gable is that it was uh, infilled in turf, which would give greater stability. Um, if you tried to take field boulders up to a, such a steep pitch, they would simply um, fall over and would be unstable. We also see here an outshot on the south side of the uh, cottage and uh, on the north side there's evidence of a smaller gable which had been a part of the uh, cottage which had, had been lost uh, prior to this date. The buttresses um, to the rear wall are also recognisable in the present building. But the question has to be asked, was the moor always so barren? I think something which is uh, very often overlooked is that the Lord President, Duncan Forbes of Culloden, was a noted earlier, uh, was a noted early improver. And he acted at one stage um, as an agent um, in the early 18th century uh, to improving the second Duke of Argyll's estates. And it's quite clear that um, he encouraged uh, tenants onto the uh, moor to set up farms, and he did so on favourable uh, terms. And perhaps the um, best evidence that we have of this is a critical account of Alexander uh, Carlyle, who visited the battlefield in 1765. And he stated uh, um, then that the most surprising thing on Culloden Muir is the number of houses and the quantity of cornfields that are to be seen on it for a stretch of two to three miles. 
by 1840, the old farms had faded away. They were no longer viable. And uh, surviving examples were saved only through uh, commemoration um, as, 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 as part of the uh, battlefield. Uh, these were um, restored um, by uh, Duncan Forbes of Culloden and uh, preserved in 1881. And, um, it might be thought as an act of atonement. Um, this is Valentine's photograph of the King's stables um, and shows a building uh, here, which is very similar in plan to how old Leonard Farm would have appeared. So it sets up the notion that there had been a, a standard typology here, which was being repeated, and also shows that there had been a hearth uh, in, uh, in a central, uh, on a central partition or within the centre of the uh, of the house. This photograph of old Leonard uh, Cottage is of a similar date, showing the memorial cairn uh, in the background, which is erected in 1881 as part of the mem memorialization of the site. But it shows that the land around the cottage um, has been uh, ploughed. Improvements have been carried out to the cottage um, by Forbes and has been made habitable for Bell MacDonald, um, who acted uh, as a battlefield battlefield field guide, guide as her grandfather had done uh, and he was alive at the time of the battle. She died in 1912 uh, after which the house was abandoned. Then along, uh, along came the cavalry and this was in the form of the, here we have the leading lights of the Inverness Gallic Society who in the early 1920s became extremely concerned about the state of the monuments um, especially as the estate had changed hands in 1897. And, and these included the two thatched uh, houses. Um, so standing on the Cumberland Stone um, amongst the dignitaries um, are the redoubtable Alexander Nicholson, secretary of the society, referred to as a thorn in the side of the National Trust uh, throughout the first decades of the uh, 20th, uh, middle decades of the 20th century. To his um, right uh, and to the left is Thomas Munro, uh, Colin Munro's um, grandfather, um, uh, who was an architect, although he's nearing retirement, he dedicated his services uh, to um, repairing Old Leonard uh, Cottage without expectation of fee. And uh, the uh, figure in, in the front of the stone is uh, Dr. Alexander Ross, the celebrated Highland uh, architect. Now, this photograph um, is likely to have been uh, taken in the 1930s after minimal repairs have been undertaken by the Gallic Society, which they completed in 1925. Uh, new doors and windows were introduced and broom thatch uh, was, um, uh, um, uh, was was um, added to the roof. It shows the outshot um, to the front of the house, um, which is, uh, has always been assumed to have been a bed recess. But the main thing um, to take from this photograph is the degree to which the authenticity of the original house had been uh, preserved. Um, and the, a new gable was likely to have been built uh, in the 18, uh, 1880s and the masonry build um, is, is rather better than that for the rest of the house. But then sadly, uh, disaster struck. Um, the cottages required a constant drain on the resources of the society and even constant repairs to the roofs. And so we think after the uh, Second World War, the society replaced the roof, ignoring all historic precedent. And, it, and the, the cottage is shown here um, as a visitor center, which opened in 1961 um, in the care of the National Trust for Scotland. Um, but what we see is some rebuilding by the National Trust to create a stone uh, chimney head, which replaced the original uh, wooden uh, flue. Uh, and the roof pitch uh, was uh, put in at a significantly lower pitch than the original. I've introduced this slide um, for amusement. It shows two icons of British television in the 1960s, 1970s, Robin Day and Quentin Hogg, Lord, Lord Helsham, uh, being filmed at uh, Culloden in 1974. Um, a new visitor centre was opened in 1970, which re relieved the pressure on the old cottage. 
but I mean, the amusement to me is the camera crew look about as her suit as the rustic thatching to the, to the buildings. Now this shows uh, just how ridiculous uh, the cottage had uh, become um, uh, the interior uh, of the building and its role as a visitor center. There's a complete fact, uh, uh, sorry, there's a complete lack of any measurable authenticity. Um, and it was extremely popular and overrun by visitors. Um, and what is, is sort of hidden behind here, the original crux of the cottage, which had been uh, mercifully preserved as part of the gable, um, which, were, which were not taken away when the new roof was uh, added. Source references uh, come from some strange uh, places, and these crack blades are all that were left of some properties after the Muckle Spate in 1829. And uh, appear in Thomas Dick Lauder's uh, book. They so show structures at Waterside near Forest uh, destroyed by the River Findhorn. Um, increasingly, um, the cottage became a major embarrassment to the uh, uh, to the NTS. And by 1978, um, they determined to replace the crux uh, to the building and the roof. And they were reconstructed in both uh, oak and elm, finished in, 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 in adzes. Uh, and the, the profile of this was based on analysis that was carried out. But the analysis does not conform to the evidence of what had survived from the, uh, from the original uh, cottage, which uh, is, is shown here. These are the original crack blades, um, which have survived in the end of Gable. Um, Oldly in a, uh, old near a cottage after this time found new life as a battlefield dressing station and the work was um, extremely well intended, well carried out, but it had adopted uh, inadvertently a typology uh, from the west coast rather than from uh, this, this part of the central northern highlands. The cottage was descheduled in 2003 and downgraded to a B listing at that time. And this was as a result of archaeological investigations, um, which were carried out for the popular TV series, Two Men in a Trench. Um, and uh, Tony Pollard and Neil Oliver were um, trying to um, locate the red barn for which they found no evidence uh, on the site at Old Leonard. Um, and they came to the conclusion, taking other matters into account, that this um, old Lena had been on a completely different site uh, to this, might have been close by, but this therefore um, had been a new farm that had been built in the mid 19th century. But clearly from all the other evidence, this uh, could not possibly have been so. There is compelling evidence that the shell of uh, old Lena uh, cottage was either from the 1730s or erected shortly after the battle uh, um, in the 1750s. And uh, dendrochronology of the trusses may, prov may provide the answer here. The designation, I understand, is being reviewed in, in, in uh, the light of this, uh, this um, new evidence, uh, but it is unchanged at the, at the present date, but it does remain the most photographed thatch house in Scotland. Uh, but also tantalizingly inaccessible to those who photograph it. So in conclusion, the field survey work, which I've uh, covered very briefly uh, tonight and the reports that were written, um, have resulted in a reappraisal of the history of uh, many of these sites, sites um, history which has had to be rewritten. There are countless typologies um, uh, which, which abound from this work, uh, uh, not read about. And there are many that are still to be uncovered and recorded properly. It's also critical um, to raising awareness of the immediate plight of so much of Scotland's vernacular heritage. So at this point, Roland, I uh, pass the um, screen back to you.